Welcome to the Atlas Hour, the ultimate journey towards unlocking your full potential. Join us as we delve into the fascinating realms of science, philosophy and motivation to unravel the mysteries of the human condition. Pour your coffee and get ready for enlightening discussions, empowering insights and practical tools to optimize every aspect of your life with your hosts, Dr. Adam Hotchkiss and Josh Lewis. Hey guys, welcome back to the Atlas Hour. Today we have a really special guest. We have Kristen Holmes. And I got to tell you, Kristen, every day, like in my head, I keep calling you Katie Holmes in my head because it's like <laughs> K Holmes. I yeah, made yeah. a reel the other day. I was going to put up like a, a question and I literally said Katie Holmes. And then about an hour later, I'm like, oh my God, it's not Katie Holmes. And I deleted it. <laughs> it's pretty funny. But anyways, welcome. It, it could be far worse people to be mistaken, you know, just, uh, yeah. True. Yes, <laughs> but, but maybe you could tell us a little bit about your background, uh, your expertise and, and kind of stuff you're working on now before we dive into everything. Yeah. So I'm a psychophysiologist and um, I study the, the kind of determinants of human flourishing. So I look at uh, sleep, strain, recovery, or, you know, strain, cardiovascular load, uh, activity type uh, behaviors, um, circadian type behaviors. Uh, yeah, and I, and I kind of look at uh, both it from I study it from a physiological lens as well as a, as well as a psychological lens. So I'm pulling in lots of psychological measures that are kind of running uh, alongside the physiological metrics that we track. Uh, all via Whoop, so Whoop is of course in all of my studies. I'm the vice president of performance science and, and principal scientist. So uh, I'm running a lot of these studies to really try to unpack what behaviors are the most. Uh, I guess, uh, impactful on the metrics that we say are important to track, you know, that really yeah. do give you an indication of, uh, your health span and, and kind of what that trajectory looks like for you. Um, awesome. so I, I think my real interest is really is understanding, you know, what are, you know, what are, what's kind of the taxonomy of behaviors, you know, if we were to kind of distill it down to, all right, there's a core set of foundational behaviors that, are kind of non-negotiable in the sense of how they move around kind of our physiology and psychology. And it's kind of my hypothesis or my feeling that um, there is in fact like some sort of taxonomy. And uh, so a lot of my research is trying to, to kind of, I, I suppose, prove out that thesis that um, there are certain things that we can do for ourselves that uh, really do move the, move the needle, um, you know, more than others. Um, and, and really what are the kind of tolerable uh, kind of levels of, um, a flexibility do we have? Um, and I can kind of dig into that more because I think that's really important. You need to have some level of flexibility, of course, mm -hmm. because, you know, you don't want to be too rigid in, in your behaviors. Right. But at the same time, you know, knowing how rigid you have to need, you need to be is, I think, is, is a really important insight as we kind of try to carve out uh, what our day looks like and what our night's going to look, you know, uh, yeah. like leading into bed, et cetera. Awesome. Well, yeah, I kind of look at you as definitely being like a, a recovery specialist. And I think that's huge. Um, mm. I was hoping today to kind of dive into sleep because mm. it, sleep is something that kind of vexes me. And you know, we see thousands of, of patients a year. And I would say probably 90% of them will tell me they've got diet figured out, they've got exercise figured out, they've got their nutrition, their supplements, everything figured out. But sleep is something that a lot of people struggle with. Mm. And it's the hardest thing for us to do. And you know, it's sure you can throw a medication or something at people, but really dialing in why is their sleep so fragmented or you know, disturbed in some way. Um, so I would love to talk to you about sleep if, if you're okay, yeah. because I think that yeah, it's so, so vital. And I think maybe just to start out as simple as it sounds and, and some, but I don't, I don't think it is that simple. Can you just tell us what is sleep? Yeah. I mean, sleep is a, is a, kind of a, a biological uh, 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 phenomenon, I suppose, that we actually you know, don't know a ton about, but it's, it's really when all the magic you know, restoration, both physically, mentally, and emotionally really happens. Uh, it's during, uh, it's during our, our biological sleep. Um, and that can happen, of course, during the day if you're shift working, that can happen during the night. Um, but there is a lot of evidence, of course, that um, you know, we get the best, most restorative sleep during uh, what would be kind of our, our uh, the biological night. So what is, mm -hmm. you know, when it's dark outside, uh, that's when we should ideally be sleeping. And that's when uh, we're going to have the best possible sleep. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's vital, you know, it, it impacts uh, every single cell tissue organ in our body. Um, and when we don't get it, uh, we really do suffer. Uh, and we set ourselves up for, you uh, 
you know, less than optimal physical, mental, and emotional functioning. So uh, we can kind of dig into kind of all the parameters around that. But um, yeah, and, it, and you know, I think for lots of wearables will, um, you know, kind of, you know, there's a, a traditional way of, of kind of looking at sleep, the more clinical medical. Um, but, you know, for our purposes, we, we try to simplify it for our users and we, we break it down into awake, light, RAM, and slowly of sleep. Um, and, you know, all of those kind of stages are important. Um, and it's really how you transition from one stage to the next, which kind of tells you the health of your sleep, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Um, and you definitely need to spend, uh, you know, a, a good amount of time uh, in these deeper stages of sleep. So in REM, where that, you know, that's where all the memory consolidation is happening, where you're regulating your emotions, where, you know, just you're cleaning, clearing out a lot of the toxins. You know, it's kind of that moment during sleep where you're getting rid of a lot of the garbage from the day. Um, and when you don't have that REM sleep, you don't give yourself that opportunity. So you can kind of imagine that you know, without REM sleep, you kind of carry forward into your waking hours, uh, you know, uh, less, probably less uh, kind of um, uh, optimal cognitive functioning. Mm -hmm. uh, and slow sleep is, is really where the physical regeneration happens. You get this huge bolus of, of human growth hormone early in your sleep. So, um, and I think, you know, there's, uh, I think some emerging evidence that uh, indeed, that first bolus of, of protein kind of happens uh, very early in your sleep. So somewhere between kind of 11 p.m. And, and 12 a.m. And in fact, if you aren't sleeping during that time, you might not be capitalizing on um, as much of that um, of that of that uh, of, of, of that human growth hormone. So Meaning that it, even if you went to sleep, you know, at three and still got eight hours of sleep since you weren't in that time window, there may yeah. be something linked to the, the time of day. For sure. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a real, um, yeah, I think like our notion, you know, I just got back from this really cool conference. Um, it was a chronobiology conference and I was, you know, kind of running into some of the folks who have done a lot of this. It's just really incredible sleep research. And, uh, one of the, 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 the researchers, um, I talked a fair amount to is, uh, Dr. Ken Wright. And he did a, a fascinating study where he basically took a group of folks who, had both kind of morning um, uh, kind of preferences, the larks, um, and then the evening uh, folks, uh, the, the night owls, and kind of put them on a mountain, and uh, they didn't have access to any of artificial light. And what he was trying to understand is just what is this notion of chronotype, you know, and, and when, when would these folks kind of fall asleep? Well, you know, I think within 72 hours, uh, they all fell asleep within 30 minutes of each other. So I think what we think about chronotype that, you know, some people are just going to bed at 1 a.m. And that's like that that's a preference yeah. <laughs> that's not being driven biologically. We haven't evolved, I think, um, uh, I think outside of, of what Ken's found in the study that we in, in a lot of there's been a lot of studies that have uh, been done on hunter gatherer kind of populations that, you know, don't kind of live the kind of modern lifestyle, don't have access to artificial light. And indeed, they're all falling asleep within, you know, 30 minutes of one another, um, hmm. for the most part. So, so I, I think this notion of chronotype is, um, is, is, is not kind of what we think about it in, in our society. And, and I think the evidence around, you know, when we release that human growth hormone, um, I think is further evidence that we probably should be trying to fall asleep before 11 PM. Um, and this, there's another incredible paper on mood and just brain circuitry that, that, um, that, that basically found when we're viewing light in the retina. So as much as I think 80 lux of, of light or as little as 80 lux of light are, um, it has a pro depressive effect in that our dopamine system next day just doesn't function as, as optimally. So, mm -hmm. you know, again, I think more evidence that there there's, there's probably a sweet spot of when we should be falling asleep and it's, it's most certainly not after 11 PM. Right. Um, so, yeah. So, do you know when that battle. sweet spot is? I know yeah, you said before eleven, but is yeah, there? Yeah, I, mean, I think it's slightly time? different for everyone. And you know, and again, I, I don't know that the the research is one hundred percent here. I'm kind of patching it right. together, and, yeah. and and certainly I have access to millions of uh, millions of of of, of, uh, of uh, sleeps. So, um, you know, I, I have a bit of a. I guess a God's view, I suppose, that, that this kind of problem. And um, there's no question that the individuals who are going to bed before uh, before 11 p.m. and within uh, and minimizing their variability, so kind of when they go to bed and when they wake up, 
we call this kind of night to night variability, sleep wake variability. Mm -hmm. um, the narrower that window, um, it seems, um, the healthier their recovery metrics. So when you think about resting heart rate and heart rate variability, um, respiratory rate, um, they seem to be in more optimal ranges relative to age. Um, and uh, when folks are, uh, are going to bed before 11 uh, p.m., we also see relationships between these recovery metrics. Um, and indeed, uh, the other big piece, the more stable the sleep-wake time, again, the less variable, um, we see a higher quality of sleep. So I think back to kind of your earlier question, like why aren't people getting sleep or getting quality sleep? Well, a lot of it is because people don't recognize or realize the importance of stabilizing when they go to bed and when they wake up. That's actually, and if I were to say, if I, we were to stop the podcast now, <laughs> that's the most important, I think, behavior we, we have as human beings is going to bed and waking up at similar times. There's so much connected to that one behavior um, that I think when you, when I, when I think about non-negotiable and it doesn't, okay, you don't have to be, you don't have to be perfect, <laughs> but when, right. when you think about your month, you know, you want to try to probably 25 days out of the month, you want to try to go to bed and wake up um, within, you know, 45 with maybe 45 minutes of variability, but you want to try to keep it as, as low as possible. Right. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's all I I'm glad because I, I give my patients that advice all the time is first things first, go to sleep, same time every night, wake up same time every morning, even on the weekends. Yes. Um, that's been super beneficial for myself. And I think that when people start doing that, they see a lot of improvements for yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, I would love to dive into some of the ramifications of poor sleep. Um, mm -hmm. just anecdote from what I've seen, which has been very interesting is we, we will have people because people who come to us are very, um, they're usually very fit. You know, they're really trying to optimize their health. They're not, they're not even your average person. These are very, mm -hmm. very fit individuals, but it's more than more than a handful of times I've seen an extremely fit individual with very good health metrics other than their insulin. They have sky high fasting insulin and they may even be pre-diabetic, which they're very confused about. And when I dive into it, they're usually shift workers or uh, mm -hmm. one guy in particular I just saw in the past week, he was in the military, I think a military police and he had to work night and he had a really hard time sleeping through the day. But this guy, you know, he, then you look at this phenotype, you would never think pre-diabetic insulin resistant, mm -hmm. but he was. And I hypothesize this is the only kind of crack that I could see in his lifestyle was asleep. Is mm -hmm. that something you see often is impairment in metabolic health? There's no question. I mean, I think to go back to the night to night variability and, and it's, it's like without tracking it, it's really hard to, to, to know obviously when you're falling asleep, right? Like it, it's, and that's why, like, I really appreciate, you know, whoop, because it tells me exactly what my sleep consistency is. So I, I know literally by the minute, like what my, what my variability is, but yeah, with every hour of variability in time, to bed in time of sleep, it increases your metabolic abnormality, abnormality by up to 27%. Wow. Like 27%. Like we're not talking about kind of marginal, but you can imagine if you're, if the bouncier that night to night variability is, like you, you just, you increase your insulin resistance, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you know, you're, you know, it's just the fast track to metabolic dysfunction. So we see direct effects with night to night variability and, and metabolic functioning. So, yeah, I mean, I think that to me is the big one to press on. I think the other one that ha I think is very much related is making sure that you're giving a three hour buffer of when you have your last calorie and mm. when you intend to sleep. And this is called time restricted eating. This isn't intermittent fasting. This is a different this time restricted eating has a circadian component. Um, mm -hmm. but I think that, that two of the most powerful behaviors people can adopt if they want to improve their health within two to four weeks, they literally stabilize your sleep wake time and give a three hour buffer between when you have your last calorie, and when you intend to go to sleep. And if you can keep that window of when you're eating your calories, ideally when the sun is up, um, and maybe an eight to 10 hour windy window, I think you'll get probably 60% of your weight loss goals. And you will write your, I mean, you can, they've done some studies with folks that did an eight hour window and they, um, they, uh, they go from being pre-diabetic to back to normal levels within two weeks. Wow. Yeah. That's very impressive. Can yeah. you dive into a little bit of the, the mechanistic side of what is it about not eating before sleep that improves or, or maybe what, what about eating before sleep dysregulates it? A dysregulates. Yeah. It's, um, 
So, okay, so it, it's, this is gonna come, this is gonna be a little surprising, but I think it's tied to sleep. It's melatonin production. Mm, okay. So when you think, when you look at the pathways, so you've got night to night variability and kind of indirect when you increase the amount of variability of when you go to bed and when you wake up, you basically decrease your melatonin production. Melatonin production is tied to insulin sensitivity. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that that's, that's the connection and that's the relationship. You can't really isolate these things. Like that's the, yeah. that's what I think the part of the problem is that these behaviors are, are, are intertwined, especially these circadian behaviors. You know, the, 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 you know, when we go to bed, when we view light, when we, when we expose ourselves right. to light, when we restrict light, um, these things are it's so in this modern world that we live in, like it, there's probably nothing more important than kind of dialing in these circadian behaviors. Is there something about food in particular, insulin pathway or something that blunts other hormones to that would put you sleep? Is it the insulin on melatonin? Is that it? Or yes, is it exactly. Rexin or, okay. Yeah, gotcha. it's the insulin on the melatonin that I think is, is the problem. Yeah. And is that not remedied by just supplementing with oral melatonin? Oh God. Yeah. I mean, I, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, I mean, I, I know that, you know, obviously you need to, to talk to your, your primary care physician and, or your, you know, whoever your, right. your kind of doctor is that you're working with uh, around melatonin. But, um, I think, uh, you know, anything you're layering, you know, I, I think if you're meant to produce it endogenously, mm -hmm. um, unless you're traveling, like you need to, to, you need to engage in the behaviors to kind of get yourself back on track. I think melatonin short term can potentially be helpful, but it hasn't actually, it doesn't actually, it's not actually shown to, it might help you fall asleep, um, but it doesn't actually help you stay asleep. So right. it, it's again, like it's getting to the root cause of why are you not having a consolidated sleep experience? Like yeah. it, we're, we're, we're set up to do this very, very well as humans. So the hard truth is your, you know, your behaviors during the day are sabotaging your ability to get that restorative quality consolidated uh, sleep experience. So, yeah. um, you know, and it, it really starts with, you know, getting that sunshine in the eyes when you wake up, you know, I know that that's kind of a hot thing. Lots of people are talking about it, which is, which I, as a circadian kind of person, um, I'm super excited about that, sure. but it's, it's really important. I mean, that kickstarts your cortisol, kind of the, we talked about from a hormonal perspective, like that's kind of the cortisol and melatonin are kind of the bookend hormones. Yeah. Um, you know, when you wake up, you want that bolus of cortisol to kind of tell your body that it's time to be alert. And that's also going to, um, kind of start your, your sleep pressure and tell you when, um, you know, without that bolus of cortisol, melatonin doesn't know kind of when to be, re when to, to be released, um, or that timing might not be, uh, that signaling might not be as robust or as strong. Um, so, so that release of melatonin is so, so important and giving into that pressure for sleep is also really important. Um, what happens when we release melatonin and we fight through it and stay awake is our body now doesn't feel safe. So the other mechanism to consider is that uh, when you're staying, when you're staying awake, um, you're basically activating the, the, the sympathetic branch of, of the nervous system, right? So um, as you can imagine, you know, you're kind of in this fight or flight, um, your, your body doesn't feel safe. So even if you're tired and you end up falling asleep, maybe 90 minutes later, um, you're not going to produce melatonin again, right? Like that, mm -hmm. like you get one chance and, and yeah. that's kind of it. And and what's important to note with melatonin, it's not just the sleepy hormone, right? Like it's neuroprotective. It's, you know, it's related to, to, to our metabolism. Like there, there's like melatonin is like such a critical hormone. So if you are not producing melatonin endogenously, um, that's a problem. And I think there's probably a problems related to, you know, uh, taking uh, exogenous uh, melatonin in, in, in a super physiological levels. Like that also can't be good. More is not better, right? So um, I think we just need to be really, really careful and, and try to just stabilize some of these behaviors that we know um, can can kind of set us up for, for success. Yeah. I think melatonin too, to your point, I think it's probably one of, I think it's my favorite antioxidant in the body, endogenous antioxidant for sure. I mean, glutathione gets a lot of credit, but yeah. melatonin is super cool when you look at the mechanism of it like every metabolite of it is also an, an antioxidant, which we don't usually see, you know, you usually have yes, an antioxidant metabolite to some other thing that's inactive, but that yes. just continues on down the pathway to be antioxidant after antioxidant. So it's really cool. There's some interesting literature on the anti-cancer effects of it. Um, so it, it is a really, really cool thing. Yep, absolutely. Point. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. Another thing that I see often that I was wondering is it seems like sleep tends to kind of shorten or, or get not as, as, uh, as good as we age. Is there like a physiologic reason to that? Is it just because we're busier? You know, what is it that's causing that? It's the d decrease in melatonin. Um, oh, interesting. So yeah, is that due so to male gland age. calcification or something? Or? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's age related, you mm -hmm. know, our, um, but I, but I think that's where we want to try to protect that signaling. We want to try to protect that robustness of, of our melatonin. And there's, from a behavior standpoint, there's things that we can do during the day to kind of protect, protect that, you know, it's, it's the light viewing and it's the light restriction. Um, we want to, again, try to ensure that that signaling is as, as robust and strong as possible. So when we're viewing tons of bright lights after the sun goes down, it really confuses our system. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, melatonin, you know, is going to be confused. <laughs> like doesn't know. It thinks that you're supposed to be awake. So it's, it's not going to get released or it's not going to get released at the strength. So if you continuously kind of put yourself in a position where you're not releasing the melatonin, um, you know, that's going to obviously, in, in, you know, in, uh, kind of create a very fragmented sleep experience. Um, and it, and it just worsens with, with, you know, with age. So I think the other piece is stress. Um, mm -hmm. you know, there's stress and sleep are, um, you know, literally related really, uh, you know, the more stressed we are oftentimes, the more, uh, the, 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 the longer our sleep onset late, you know, the, the, you know, we have, you know, more sleep onset latency. It takes us longer mm -hmm. to fall asleep. And then we have, you know, a more fragmented sleep experience. I think people can identify with that, you know, 2am waking, yeah. right. Where our cortisol starts to rise and it actually wakes us up when, um, we, sh we shouldn't be waking up at that time. But, um, if we have a lot of stress in the tank, going into sleep, you know, we can kind of think about it, you know, as, um, you know, as you uh, kind of, as you move through your day, um, if you're not kind of um, mapping your stress with appropriate amounts of rest, it will generally rear its head in your sleep. And, yeah. and it's, so I think that is another behavior that can go a long way toward helping us uh, get you know, a, a, a better, you know, a more consolidated sleep and, and, and fall asleep faster is, um, is definitely managing stress throughout, uh, practically throughout the day. And that's really, you know, when you think about this from a autonomic nervous system standpoint, like we really want to, uh, try to engage the parasympathetic branch of our nervous system. So we can do that consciously just through breath work. Mm -hmm. So very simply, you know, a double inhale followed by an extended exhale and just principally your inhale wants to be shorter than your exhale and, and, You'll, you'll absolutely decrease your heart rate if you can, if you just do that. Um, and you don't have to do it forever, you know, just 30 seconds, a minute, you know, after bouts of stress and you just do this proactively three or four or five times, you know, definitely before bed. And you can really put yourself into a nice calm state um, that's, that will find its way into, into your sleep in a, in a positive way. So yeah, managing stress proactively is huge. Yeah, that's probably the biggest one that I hear. Most people tell me they have no issue falling asleep, but it's mm -hmm. that midnight or you know, in the middle of the night, wake up yep. where something wakes too. them up. True. Yeah. Yep. I mean, alcohol, dehydration. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. And so, I, and a lot of times something we will order something like a Dutch test and we do see mm -hmm. that inappropriate spike of cortisol, which is waking them up at night. And then they feel just, you know, they're, they're wide awake. They're sympathetically driven. They're racing. They can't stop. Um, so you're saying that, that the breath work throughout the day can help to lower that. Um, is there other things, um, like mindful meditation or does the exercise play into that? You know, what other that yeah. behaviors can people do throughout the day? Yeah. Um, so meditation mindfulness can be amazing for some folks. Uh, actually meditation often, uh, engages the sympathetic branch of the nervous system. Hmm. Um, and it's kind of one of the reasons why, and I, I find, um, you know, meditation and uh, mindfulness, I think, are, are skills. Are, they're, they're worth practicing. But what I love about uh, breath work is that we can really modulate our heart rate, uh, mm -hmm. you know, consciously just through a breath protocol, breath work protocol that anyone can kind of follow. So, um, you know, we can't guarantee necessarily that, you know, you spend 10, 20 minutes in a mindfulness practice or a meditation and we you can't necessarily guarantee that that's actually reducing stress. <laughs> right. um, so that's one of the reasons why I, I really do love um, kind of prescribing breath work as a, as a way to uh, bring yourself back into balance um, and, you know, activate that parasympathetic branch of the nervous system, reduce the cortisol. Um, 
and, and epinephrine and adrenaline and kind of get your, your body kind of back to homeostasis before you engage in, in that next task. But mm. I, I think what people, um, I think it seems kind of simple though. So people will kind of dismiss it as like, oh, this is so, this is too simple. Like it, there's no yeah. way it can have like a, an, an impact, but, but I think it, it, I, try it. <laughs> you know, I know that, you know, I've been doing breath work for 10 years. I've been tracking my heart variability and my sleep for a very, very long time. And I can say that, you know, when I don't engage, um, my chances of waking up at that kind of 2 a.m. mark mm -hmm. um, are a heck of a lot higher than if I'm proactively managing my stress throughout the day. Interesting. So, yeah. So I think that's huge. Exercise, no question. Um, you know, and we actually, we just did some research. This is not published yet, but we see an absolute kind of, it is unreal when you look at the data. There's an absolute kind of circadian effect of, um, of exercise timing on sleep. So mm -hmm. if you, um, when we see, when you are exercising within four hours, uh, people's sleep efficiency goes in the tank. Mm -hmm. So um, again, it goes back to the principle of, you know, you've got, you've got an active phase of your circadian rhythm and you've got an inactive phase of your circadian rhythm. And I think if people just understand principally, again, not, it doesn't have to be every day, but you know, as many times as you can throughout the month, you want to make sure that during the active phase of your circadian rhythm, which is when the sun is up, you want to be exercising and socializing and eating and mm -hmm. um, viewing lots and lots of light, you know, ideally sunshine, uh, natural light, but um, artificial lights, okay, too. And then once the sun goes down, you know, generally speaking, we want to be you know, deactivating. Um, we want to be, we want to make our body feel really safe. Um, we want to be giving, telling, giving it cues that it's time to go to bed. We don't want to ask our body to digest food um, mm -hmm. because it's really hard to, to, to sleep when your body, it, it's hard to, uh, so when you think about this mechanistically, um, so basically the uh, digestion will compete with sleep. And <laughs> you think about mm -hmm. it that way. So, um, so oftentimes when people are experiencing a fragmented sleep or like, why am I not getting deeper stages of sleep? It's because your heart rate is, is running a little bit higher. Um, heart rate variability is a little bit depressed. Um, you know, when you're kind of, uh, working hard to digest, mm -hmm. digest food. And as a result, you kind of, uh, rob, um, your, your, from your kind of sleep, from your stored of sleep to kind of enable all of this, um, really expensive, um, digestion, digestive work that's going yeah. on. So you want to try to make sure that you're not like competing, um, like during sleep, you want to just focus on, so let your body just be, you know, be fasting and just allow it to do all the cleaning and all the, all the work that it, that needs to go into kind of restoring and, and getting it back to neutral. So you can ta tackle the next day. We have a, a, a lot of bodybuilders, I think, who follow the podcast and are listening. Mm -hmm. and, and one thing that they do a lot is eat before bed. And I've been yeah. on a few podcasts with them and and I tell them, you know, don't eat before bed. And they usually have such a big pushback against that, you know, because they want to get those calories in. So mm -hmm. they think that they're filling up glycogen stores and things throughout the night. Um, you are a, an athlete yourself. You work mm -hmm. with a lot of athletes. What kind of performance decline can people expect to see? Or for the bodybuilders, like, will we see a, a less muscle being built if people are not getting adequate sleep? No question. Yeah. I mean, just the <laughs> human growth hormone, right? Like it's, yeah. it's, um, yeah, I mean, you know, and there's, there's some good evidence, obviously, in the literature that, you know, protein can absolutely be helpful during sleep. Um, but I, I think I would just make sure um, that we have some, I hate, I hate saying this, but, you know, trending towards significance <laughs> that protein can, can uh, certain types of protein can be helpful um, for, for sleep. But, um, but I, I still think you want to give yourself that two hour buffer, right? You don't yeah. want anything uh, compromising that that, that bolus of, of human growth hormone. So I think for body builders, there is absolutely no question that sleep is your biggest competitive advantage. Yes. Um, if you want to build muscle, you have to figure out how do I get into these deeper stages of sleep? How do I just crush my sleep every single night? I mean, sleep, wake time. I mean, I find bodybuilders to be extremely disciplined, right? I mean, they're kind of mm -hmm. right. They're kind of remind me of the wrestlers. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of just their mindset and mentality and their ability to kind of do really hard things. Um, so you can do all those hard things, like just stabilize when you go to bed and when you wake up, <laughs> right. do that thing. Um, and, and, and really prioritize getting to bed before 11. So kind of setting up, you know, getting that, that first morning bit of sunshine before you get in the gym, spend five, 10 minutes outside in the natural sunlight, 
So you're again telling your system what in the heck it needs to be doing. It needs to be alert. It needs to be awake, um, and really try to be consistent when in terms of when you're eating your your food. Um, mm -hmm. We do show that you know early eaters um, tend to be metabolically healthier and metabolically more efficient and flexible. Mm -hmm. um, so making sure that um, they're you know kind of spacing, I suppose, the protein throughout the day uh, is is probably the most effective strategy. Um, and when you think about just the principles of, um, of building muscle and kind of how protein yeah. is utilized throughout the day. So we've got go to bed, wake up same time, preferably go to bed before 11, um, view sunlight right away, some breathing practices throughout the day, exercise in the early part of the day. Mm -hmm. um, I think the light one before bed is something that a lot of people struggle with, uh, yeah. you know, obviously just due to the modern structure of our environment. Are things like blue light and blocking glasses effective at all? Is that enough? Yeah. Or what are some tools that you implement to help to reduce the blue light yep. before going to bed? They definitely help. Um, I think too, just making sure, um, you know, cause kids, you know, have a circadian rhythm too, you know? And I think mm -hmm. if you have children in your household, like really teaching them early or getting them used to having a dimmer kind of home environment, you know, like once the sun goes down, like, our house is pretty dark. <laughs> um, obviously, it's it's light enough to move around safely, but um, but you know everyone everyone wears blue light blocking glasses to just try to you know at least kind of feel like we're doing everything that we can. Um, mm -hmm. And then I would say the you know on your screens, you know definitely making sure that you have that um, you know flux kind of screen. Um, obviously, the Apple has like uh, a really nice night feature mode or where yeah where it has yeah. night mode. Um, so yeah, I think all of those, um, uh, you know, yeah, I think all of those things kind of add up and, and are really helpful. Um, so yeah, awesome. definitely. Yeah. And then where, where do wearables come in? You know, should everybody ideally wear a wearable or are there some people who it, it wouldn't benefit? You know, where, yeah. where does that all play in? So I think it's like just having a perspective, you know, it's, again, mm -hmm. it's like, it's, I think some people feel, I mean, I'm, I'm of the mind that, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're in a, we're at a, a kind of a position and, and kind of history where wearables are really accurate. Mm -hmm. um, I think particularly whoop, um, it gives you very, very good data about how your health is trending. And, you know, I, I think from my standpoint, like I want to know, you know, I, I'd rather know the truth. Uh, and we get literally testimonials. I mean, I read one today at our all hands, you know, a testimony of a person who, um, you know, tore their ACL and thought about kind of taking whoop off, you know, while they were recovering and, and ended up not taking it off. And this person, um, you know, noticed something really crazy in her heart and uh, her heart rate variability and resting heart rate. And she's like, something is not right. And it was really egregious deviations mm -hmm. from her baseline. Uh, you know, and you would expect if you're recovering from a surgery, um, so this this was data post-surgery, um, she ended up keeping whoop on, of course, and, um, and you know, she had this real egregious deviation from, from her baseline, and she was just like, God, something is wrong. So she went to her doctor, her physical therapist was like, ah, it's fine, like, this is totally normal, you know, to be feeling this way. She had, but she had a lot of inflammation too, like, and then she um, went to a doctor, and the doctor was like, ah, I don't know, I, you know, you're fine. And then she finally, she goes to the emergency room. <laughs> And is like something is wrong and sure enough she had blood clots that were all oh, wow. over like in her lungs yeah like all over her body i mean had she waited she probably wouldn't have lived yeah. um she would have had a stroke or you know some sort of embolism or you know um so anyway she's fine but we get <laughs> like that's just one example from today but right. you know every friday at our team lunch we're reading these like you know, testimonies from people where it's just like, will just make you cry, you know, when you realize yeah, how you, you know, you saved my grandpa, you saved my brother, you saved, you know, like, and, and so these data can be really, really powerful to, yeah. again, just give you uh, in, just an indication of like, all right, I'm trending, you know, there's um, basically just gives you your, your baseline, right? Like knowing yeah. your baseline, I think there's, it's so critical, right? And, and I think as it relates to sleep in particular, you know, we know that there's this really strong correlation between night to night variability and physiological and psychological resilience, right? So, you know, because we have this insight, like that's just something to keep track of, you know, and if you're not getting into deeper stages of sleep, 
you know, why is that, you know, and, 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 or if you see big decreases in the time that you're spending in these, de in these deeper stages of sleep, well, mm -hmm. you can take a little bit more stock in, in how you're managing your day because how you manage your day is going to dictate how you sleep at night, hundred percent. Right. Mm -hmm. So if we're not managing our day appropriately, of course, we're not going to be able to sleep well. So, yeah. um, yeah. So I just think it gives you just this really great baseline understanding that you can just work off of for the rest of your life. Absolutely. I found it to be very enlightening. Um, you know, I would go to bed and, and usually, you know, rudimentarily we, you know, counter fingers. Okay. That's eight hours sleep we're getting. But when I looked, I'm like, wow, I actually probably need to be in bed for longer due to some waking up that I didn't know I was doing, you know, going right, to the yeah. restroom, things like that. Yeah. So to actually get my eight hours, I needed to kind of change my whole schedule around, yeah. which was very interesting. And the yeah. other thing for myself was seeing my heart rate variability, uh, mm -hmm. which I'd love to talk to you a little bit yeah. about. So maybe for the listeners, you can just explain what that is mm -hmm. first and foremost. Yeah, so heart rate variability is the time interval between heartbeats. So your heart doesn't beat like a metrodome. Um, there's uh, lots of uh, variability. So it might be, you know, uh, 0.6 and then 0.8. And then in the more variable, uh, kind of the, the, the healthier you are. So your um, so heart rate variability, it, it's a function of the heart, but it actually originates in the autonomic nervous system. And I've mentioned the autonomic nervous system a couple of times. Um, it's basically, it's, it's got two branches, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. Parasympathetic is kind of that rest and digest. Sympathetic is the fight or flight. And they're both competing to send signals to the heart. When you are super recovered, uh, your heart is going to be responsive to the demands of the autonomic nervous system. And you can kind of translate that as like you are super primed to adapt to your environment mentally, mm. physically, and emotionally. And these are kind of those moments where you're like, oh my God, I feel like I'm firing in all cylinders. And that's, and that's probably your, your heart variability is really high. Um, and, and your heart super responsive to, to these demands. So you can just kind of, you know, respond and react in your environment in a way that's kind of in line with, with what you want to do. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, so we measure heart rate variability on the Whoop platform and you can kind of see uh, when it's, uh, you know, how it might deviate from, from your baseline. And there's lots of um, uh, things that influence your, your heart rate variability. It's a very kind of non-specific metric, which uh, is, is great, you know, because not only is, you know, training stress going to impact your heart rate variability, but psychological stress is going to impact your heart rate variability as well. So, you know, um, your hydration status, um, mm -hmm. you know, the type of food that you're putting in your body, the timing of the food, the quality of your sleep. So there's lots of things that impact heart rate variability. Uh, but it gives you just this amazing snapshot, overall snapshot of how your health is trending. And there's probably not a better marker uh, to really give you this nice, nice picture of, of kind of your health status. Are there some individuals who just genetically trend lower or higher? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's very much uh, dependent. So whenever you kind of first come on board and start measuring your heart rate variability, you know, your lifestyle leading up to that moment. Um, so how you sleep and how you, you know, kind of how you hydrate, do you drink a lot of alcohol? Do you under train, do you over train, do you overeat, do you under eat, you know, all of these mm -hmm. things are going to kind of impact that, you know, where you start with your heart rate variability. Um, and, but what's great is that it is modifiable. And I mean, I've seen mine improve 17 to 20 milliseconds since I joined, um, since I started on whoop in 2016. Yeah. So, and a lot of this is just, you know, as I do this research and I, you know, see that how these behaviors are impacting, I mean, I've pretty much stopped drinking alcohol. You know, very rarely do I drink, you know, I really think more proactively about my hydration. I prioritize water. You know, I drink basically my body weight in, in, in water. I prioritize protein. I eat my body weight in, pro, in protein. Um, I really am way more sensible about how I train. Um, I, I do polarized training. You know, I strength train three times, four times a week. Um, and, you know, I stabilize when I go to bed and when I wake up. Um, you know, I don't oversleep. Um, that's another actually that can kill your heart rate variability. Um, and that's to your earlier point, like there is an absolute sweet pot spot in terms of how much time mm -hmm. you need to spend in bed and it differs from one person to the next. So there's, um, you know, breathing throughout the day, uh, just having a, a very kind of religious uh, um, breathwork practice. I do cold plunge. Uh, my sauna is broken right now, but um, love heat as well. Um, so, you know, it sounds like a lot, but just when it's kind of baked into your routine and, um, right. You know, it's just all a part of, you know, just trying to 
be available and as present as you can for the people that you love, right? Yeah, <laughs> so, absolutely. Yeah, is there a, a number, I'm sure it's very nuanced, but is there a kind of a target number that is ideal? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's heart size, it's genetics, like I said, your mm -hmm. previous behaviors. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's really just you against you. <laughs> um, and okay. that's, that's how you should, you should look at it. I mean, we definitely see, you know, the younger you are generally, the higher your heart rate variability. So there's a decrease in heart rate variability, um, you know, every year that you age. Um, and that's, you know, kind of another thing you can kind of gamify is, you know, as you age, like, can I keep improving my heart rate variability? Um, you know, to kind of, uh, yeah, just biologically kind of stay younger. And, and I think that there's some evidence for that. Um, but yeah, so it, it definitely, there's no kind of one magic, you know, number. It's, it's really just about, um, yeah, a, about knowing what your baseline is and then, you know, just adopting behaviors that are going to help improve it over time. Mine is awful. I, I'm like embarrassed to even say it. And the oh. hydration thing is interesting. I'm, I'm wondering if, uh, I think hydration is my hardest thing that I deal with. I feel like my nutrition's dialed in, my training's dialed in. Hi hydration is something I've always struggled with because I just get yeah. so into my work, um, especially even like through residency and stuff. I'd be like, oh my God, it's been 12 hours since I've had a glass of water. You know, yeah. like I need to do something. So I'm, I'm the same. I, yeah. I have to be like, I'm just like literally like I'm always – um, I have like a gallon of water just in my car all the time. And I'm just like, oh my God, I just like, when I'm driving, that's all I do mm -hmm. is I just drink. So I, I have these like little things that I've like yeah. adopted throughout the years to try to like, yeah, tackle that. Cause it is actually, yeah. When you are under hydrated, uh, that will definitely impact your HRV. No question. Interesting. Yeah. I'm, I like to gamify things as well. And I think yeah. probably most of our <laughs> listeners do. So I think that'll be the next metric or the variable that I try to change is, is water mm -hmm. and see what kind of an impact that has. It's interesting yeah. though, because I feel like I sleep pretty well. I don't feel overly stressed. I think if somebody looked from the outside in on my life, they would say you're probably pretty stressed because I'm like nonstop working. So maybe it is, <laughs> um, but I feel pretty good. And then I look at my heart rate, I'm like, oh my goodness, this is awful. Um, oh. you know, I, I well, might be getting like a 50 some nights, you know, and that's like oh. a good night for me sometimes, sometimes even lower. Yeah. It's crazy. Well, I mean, I think again, like it's, 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 uh, I wouldn't, I really wouldn't compare it. You know, I, I think it, it's, I, I know it's hard to, to say that because it's, we're just not used to doing that, but I, I mean, I would right. really look at it too, in the context of your resting heart rate, you know, mm -hmm. resting heart rate is a little bit more normalized. Um, so I, you know, I would say I, I would kind of you use that uh, to kind of see if you're in like a more normal range. Mm. I, I think that that's, a I think I should also try a whoop cause I'm using an aura ring. So I think I'll need oh. to try a whoop. Maybe, maybe whoop will help me out a little bit. Yeah, they are, <laughs> um, it, it's just when you look at, um, aura does awesome with sleep, but their heart rate variability and, and the heart rate, Australia Institute of Sport did a, a really big study. Um, they commissioned a study and, and it was, the data was published in 2022, mm -hmm. September um, and it just kind of shows that they, Australian Institute of Sport was interested in uh, kind of picking a wearable horse for the next two Olympics. Mm -hmm. So they looked at Whoop, they looked at Aura, Polar, Garmin, Sombit, um, Apple. Um, so those are the six devices and Whoop like absolutely crushed it. I think they were at, we were at like 99.9% in agreement. Wow. Um, yeah. in both heart rate and heart rate variability. Um, and I think the next closest was maybe 86%. And I think that was polar. Um, wow. Okay. 86. Yeah. So um, well, I'm glad you have a study to reference. I didn't want to put you on the spot until you no, no. Uh, and, and wrap I whoop over did, the others. Yeah. I did like a really, I did a, a kind of a thorough post on it on Instagram. If people just want to check out, I, I posted the study um, and the data so people can, can kind of have a look at that. And actually I go and I talk about HRV a ton in that, in that post, it's my most awesome. recent post, but so okay. folks can go we'll there. Put it in the, the link down below. That'll be great. And I yeah. will try to find yeah. the, um, I'll find the reference for the study and put that in there too. Mm -hmm. I think that'd be interesting. And that's good for me too, because I get that question a lot. Um, I've, I haven't worn whoop. All I've worn is the, the aura. Um, yeah. so that's interesting. I'm really happy to dive into that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, it, I didn't mean to, you know, I'm not disparaging. I'm just literally just. No, you didn't at all. You took that. You did that very yeah. well. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I was afraid to put you on the spot there and make you compare them. Um, no, no. I mean, it's, it's, it's nice to have these external studies where, you know, there was no, yeah. they, you know, they don't have any skin in the game. They're just literally trying to give a device to their athletes that they can trust, you know, so right. yeah, it was nice to come out on top. Yeah. That's awesome. 
Um, so let's see. I think, I, oh, one other thing I wanted to ask you about was um, any supplements. I know, I know we kind of talked a little bit about melatonin. Is there any supplements that you find beneficial or would recommend kind of, you know, broadly, not any specific, you know, we're not giving any, anybody any recommendations here. Talk to your doctor about that, but yeah, uh, exactly. any that you find to actually be effective. Uh, you know, um, I take AG1. Uh, okay. I, I'm honestly like really not into supplements. I mean, creatine uh, has, you know, I, I think at this yeah. point, like just really good evidence that, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, creatine is su super effective. So, you know, and, and has neuroprotective effects. Um, yeah, uh, I think a good uh, omega um, is really important. Um, and I would say, uh, I think some, some people who struggle to sleep, magnesium can be really effective at reducing anxiety, but then some people really react strangely with mag magnesium. Mm, so, um, and yeah, I would say that's, that's pretty much all I, I personally do, um, in yeah. the supplements area, I kind of try to just get everything I can from food. <laughs> and it's funny, the supplements that you recommend too, you know, you got omegas food, creatine yeah. comes in food, AG1 broken down food. Yeah. 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 So <laughs> I think that's pretty common a lot along a lot of people who are into this space is, mm -hmm. you know, we should probably get the most of what we need out of food and maybe things like omegas where it's harder to get a lot of yeah. threes unless you're pounding out fish every day and there's problems with that. You know, maybe yeah. we can take a little bit of a, a, you know, a more syn uh, synthesized one, I guess, essentially. Yeah, exactly. But, yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Was well, there anything else that you wanted to talk about today or anything new you're working on that you would like to direct people's attention to? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, we've got some a lot of like really cool research that we're um, that we're doing. You know, we've got some. We've got we're about to launch a time restricted eating study, which we're really excited about. Um, so, that's folks cool. who are on the Woot platform can participate in the study, and and that's going to go out. Um, the invitation will go out sometime probably in in late August. Um, but we're really awesome. excited about that. So, really, what we're trying to understand, you know, is there an optimal feeding window that can support, you know, sleep and recovery. Um, and, you know, if we support sleep, you know, is a eight hour window better than a 12 hour, better than a 10, you know, and yeah. can we kind of coach around that? Um, we're also really trying to lean in and, and understand uh, more specifically kind of where your, your heart rate and heart rate variability and, and markers of sleep start to degrade with um, kind of minutes of variability. So imagine, you know, for you specifically knowing, you know, once you get outside a 45 minute window, your metrics start to degrade. Mm. Um, that'd be really useful, right? Cause you know, yeah. okay, I need to stay, you know, for the most part, you know, on average, I need to be staying kind of within this window. And then we can kind of coach you to that window. Um, you know, so you kind of understand when you need to go to bed and when you wake up to kind of stay within inside this window, which we know is going to correlate with these metrics that we are uh, kind of predictive of your overall kind of health and, and well-being. Um, so yeah, we're, we're doing, uh, yeah, uh, just awesome. a lot of stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. And where can people find you specifically? Yeah. Um, so I, I post a lot of stuff on Instagram just about, you know, health and wellness and the research that we're doing. Um, we, we just actually had a, a article published in annals of surgery, uh, which is, oh. I think that, it's has a really high impact factor, I think, right behind yeah. JAMA surgery. Yeah. So um, that one was super cool looking at uh, the impact of in-house call on burnout and acute care surgeons. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, as you can imagine, you know, the more times you get called in, the more, uh, you know, that was basically linearly uh, correlated with, with burnout. Um, and there was gender effects too, you know, women uh, suffer more. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, just to see, Kind of the degradation in sleep and kind of measure cardiac measures is uh is tough you know and i and i think what i'm most excited about again is you know kind of where we started the conversation is is really helping folks who have these high stakes high stress environments in particular every human but de mm -hmm. but definitely those folks kind of what are some of the countermeasures um that they can deploy to kind of offset you know this really crazy kind of uh high stress uh uh, job. Um, so 
yeah, we're excited to to be able to bring some of those insights to. Yeah, so it sounds like in Whoop, you're kind of building that in for your users to be able to implement. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. So just yeah, so just imagine like just getting coached on these things, you know, and yeah. and again like being able to use the you know your own data, you know, to really understand. Um, and that's what I love about Whoop. It's 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 just it's your own physiology, you know. We it's yeah. it's not population kind of levels and then kind of fitting that to kind of where we think you're at, you know, this is like within person kind of mm -hmm. effects, which is really exciting. Well, Chris, you may have sold me. I, I might be uh, <laughs> heading over to whoop.com here in a minute and Good. send mine sorry. to my, my address. Yeah. Those yeah. are really exciting. Well, thank you so much. I think the listeners are really going to enjoy this. I think you have a ton of really good information. So it was a pleasure and an honor having you on. Thank you. Uh, appreciate it so much.